came here, I got more friends and family here in the class week here, which is really awesome. This kind of makes it easier on me. So um, today I'm going to be talking about mathematical recreation. Uh, no, I'm not going to be sitting here doing Sudoku for 15 minutes. I'm actually more talking about the connections of mathematics and recreation because I'm minoring in mathematics, majoring in recreation. So this whole time, up until about this semester, I've been trying to figure out these connections in my own head. So this research project was a huge personal advantage to myself in just understanding where I'm going to be carrying out this degree in my life. Um, so first, I, I started out with the definitions of mathematics and recreation. Um, so the science of numbers and their operations and relations, combinations, generalizations, abstractions, and of space configurations and their structure, measurement, transformations, and generalizations, as what Merriam-Webster says. Cutting that down, basically it's just the science of numbers and spaces. Um, spaces can be defined by numbers as long as they're given in certain dimensions and things like that. So that's the main thing. It's just science of spaces and numbers. Uh, so then, uh, Merriam-Webster says, recreation is a means of refreshment or diversion. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that's still kind of like out there a little bit. So just to pull it back into this program, we would constantly say, uh, it's just what's accomplished during leisure. So what's leisure? Leisure is free time from work or duties. So recreation is what you do in your free time from your typical day-to-day -day work or duties. Now, these two definitions, don't, or three definitions, don't really coincide at all. So this is where I kind of was starting to freak out a little bit. So I just started doing massive research and looking at as much information as possible on certain connections. So, um, so I broke down recreation into three different points uh, as a social science, as leisure itself, just generally, and then uh, as recreation management. Um, and then I started drawing, I started finding connections in between those as I kept going on and looking at more material. So first I'm going to look at math and social science, math as leisure, and then uh, math in leisure, leisure and math, and then math and recreation management. Uh, this is going to be my case study. A lot of this really kind of came out as all of it looking at this kind of case study, but the final one is going to be a direct application more of math into recreation management in line with what I was trying to go with. So, um, first math and social science, the earliest I could find was in 1953, well, uh, the Summer Institute of Mathematics for Social Scientists at Dartmouth College. Uh, now it's called the Program of Quantitative Science, so this, this program is still actually going. Uh, in 1953, what it was was, uh, it, oh, sorry, it was sponsored by the uh, Social Scientist Research Council and the Ford Foundation yeah, back then. That's where they kind of began getting their funding for it. So 60 applied in 53, 41 were accepted. Uh, eight, uh, it was eight weeks long, 20 hours of lecture weekly by four professors, um, 20, uh, 10 hours of study and supplementary lecture on top of that weekly as well and then 18 additional lecture hours. So I kind of like did a little bit of math, added some, added some extra for this 18, because I'm sure some of the lectures went an hour or two or something like that. And in eight weeks, that comes to 270 total lecture hours, which typically in a 16-week program, we're, we're doing about 300. So Bush put it best, uh, the guy who wrote the paper and stuff, and was one of the heads of the program, he said it was simply a stiff summer session in which topics of mathematics, applications of mathematics, and social sciences were taught intensively. I think that's a very pragmatic way of describing how much they actually went through. Um, and by the end of by the end of the paper, uh, by the end of the paper, pretty much uh, they just stated like it's hard to really relate social sciences and mathematics directly unless it's subjective to the scientists themselves and what their intentions are with their research. So, not every science, a social scientist is going to need high conceptual mathematics. In their, in their toolbox in order to do some of their studies. They're basically going to need just intermediate statistics and, and algebra and stuff like that to do basic mathematics. But some of them may need more. So really, they kind of just realize that that's why it's still, I guess, a program and not a degree or anything like that is because it's really definitely based on the scientist's intentions. So moving on, uh, math as leisure. I found a lot of information in my literature review that was talking about math as leisure, the, the potential for it being 
uh, benefit in the early learning process and things like that, but there was no actual studies on it or anything like that in direct data. What I did find by Sumter in an article on it, um, he said that the American standards in comparison mentioning, mentioned nothing about recreational mathematics. Uh, most countries touch upon aspects of recreational mathematics. The common theme is problem solving linked to positive emotions. Mainly what this is stating right here that I took away from this is that there's, there's a difference between America and the rest of the countries and how we view mathematics. And Sumter kept, um, kept referencing the PISA studies. And so what is PISA is put on by the OECD with Economic Operation of Development. Um, they're just a forum of governments that comes together to address economic, social, and environmental challenges of globalization. And so the piece of study that they do is they take 15-year-olds, they subject them to three major uh, tests or from around the globe as well. Uh, one reading, one mathematics, and one science. And then they rate them and give them scores on standardized scores. And so I kind of uh, took some key, com uh, some key countries here, as you can see, and the main thing I really want to point out is uh, the U.S. in general. Blue means that there was a, si a significant statistical, si they were signif significantly above the average. Those countries were yellow means that they were significantly below the average. So with the mathematic literacy, you can see actually U.S. does fall below it, and in its reading literacy, just general literacy with uh, literature and stuff, it, we actually are right about average. While the other countries, if they fall below in math, they also fall below. They fall if they're above in math, they also fall above in uh, in reading as well. So, the U.S. there is some imbalance there. Basically, is what these numbers are telling me between our emphasis on reading and, and literacy in that way, and then our emphasis in math. Um, through conversations I've had with a friend recently, it came, it came to light that kind of socially in America, it's okay to be bad at math, but it's not okay to be literate, like illiterate. That's just kind of common, which I think is unfortunate. This data kind of suggests that as well. Um, so math in leisure, there's so much there because like within leisure topics, I, I would be able to include pretty much kind of any kind of leisure activity as a math as mathematics. Um, I decided to go with sabermetrics. Uh, sabermetrics was basically a result of the Society of American Baseball Research and Creation, and was it, it research's creation in 1971. Uh, there was this massive strike in 1971 and 72 that changed a lot in American baseball. And sabermetrics coming out of that was a big thing. It's just basically methods, uh, statistical methods like least squares, regressions, and weighted averages are brought to bear on traditional baseball statistics in an attempt to find objective truths. So they'll compare for players or teams over time and be able to actually say what that player is doing performance-wise. Um, so here's kind of an example of that. So Brandon Bell, professional players, 2015 spray chart is what this is called. How this kind of changed baseball specifically is uh, coaches, defensive coaches can look at this and be able to say, okay, well, I know he's, his uh, ground ball percentage or ground balls are mostly kind of hitting between first and second. We're going to shift the field over that way. Well, okay, so that changed the game, but what did this do to leisure-wise? That's like in pro sports. What it really did was it altered the fan and spirit experience by being able to better communicate what those players are doing to fans and be in between fans. If you just say, hey, this is a good batter, that doesn't really say much as saying, oh, that guy is batting a 400. He hit, that means he, gets a, he hits the ball 40% of the time. So it kind of puts more detail and smaller information into your numbers. And then another kind of phenomenon that came out of it was a fantasy fandom. Uh, fantasy baseball was the first fantasy sport of any sport starting in the 70s with the Roto Leagues, Rotisserie Leagues. Uh, that just added a whole new element of leisure activity utilizing mathematics of baseball in order to bring that um, kind of more apparent. And it just opened up a whole new world of leisure activity for baseball, uh, for the fans. So moving on, uh, leisure and math. And I put that word up there as billiards first just because a, bit, a, lot, of me, a lot of you may have been like, oh, well, you could have used math and leisure as in billiards. but 
This is actually a form of mathematics. Um, it's called dispersing or dynamical billiards. And what it is, is uh, it's, an it's the analysis of mathematics behind geometrical reflective optics of rational surfaces and has been a significant in the, in the growing better understanding of particle physics. So, oh, I'll turn this one since it's closer. So what this, what this is saying is um, dis dis dispersing billiards. So if you look at this, this first uh, figure right here, you can see that there's two sides, they each have a designation, the D. That means diffusion coefficient. That's how much it kind of moves, uh, or the, it's the amount of movement on the plane. So this coefficient is lower than this coefficient, so there's not as much movement on this side as this side. You can kind of actually see that through these dots, which are particles. The lines connecting them are paths. The particles are a little bit closer together on this side, or far further spread apart on this side. Um, so there's, there's one part of the aspect that comes out of it. Another part is uh, this right here. Um, particles are not all the same size when it gets down to particle physics level. Some are bigger than others. So this is actually interaction movement between a smaller particle and a larger particle. And this is the, the predicted one path of one particle between these larger particles. And as you can see how it's bouncing off of it, that uh, reflective optics, geometric reflective optics, is the same thing as a cue ball bouncing off the rail and the angle that it follows off the rail. Basically are the same angles that happen down at the particle level. And so that's where the billiards comes into that. Um, really quickly, so math and rec management. I decided to go with the, uh, the little bow and um, study that they did on the, the Dunomai floodplains National Park in Austria. I'm not even really trying to pronounce that. <laughs> so, uh, the study was, was published in 2014. What they did is they used graph theory to uh, combine with GPS. Graph theory is just basically this right here. It's a study of um, points, or like waypoints is what they use them at. They're called vertexes with edges connecting them. Sometimes edges do have arrows and directions, sometimes they don't. So as you can see, there's two paths going through here and a loop going in between. Sometimes vertexes can have loops coming off of them. So here is the entire uh, national park right here, the Lobau, and these are all the different trails that go through them. You can change and, and say a lot in graph theory by altering the edges or the points in between, the lines in between the vertexes. And so thicker lines mean more, more visits along that trail as well as giving them direction, thinner lines mean less. You can also change the sizes of the vertex. So you got degree, which means just how many lines are connecting to those vertexes more vertexes, larger, more, more degrees, larger vertex. Then you got closeness and betweenness as well. And just kind of ways of just visually seeing this uh, in reference to one another is really what graph theory does. It helps draw paths and lines for understanding. This can really help optimize trail usage, interaction with the ecology around, as well as optimize the user experience. Um, Instead of just kind of having someone stand out there and take notes of how many people are walk, walking through a point, you can hand, hand hikers a GPS, go out that collect data, and then go from there after you've collected enough data and get more, more accurate information on how trail systems are being used. Um, so in conclusion, I know that was kind of a whirlwind of a lot. Um, basically what I was trying to do was figure out how I can connect math to recreation. And I wasn't really able to do that. So what I had to do first is I had to go uh, from math as a management and sociological science. And then I decided to, and then I kind of realized that leisure also fell into that. So like on the leisure side, it kind of goes both ways as you saw. And billiards kind of leans towards the math side and the saber magic leans towards the leisure side. But kind of if you reorganize this and wipe it away, oh, I have to it, it actually kind of all falls together and the lines do eventually Thank you.